You like math? No. You like trade studies? No. Ugh. You like spreadsheets? No. You like rockets? Yeah! Let's design one then! Morning everyone, I'm the pressure-fed astronaut, here to take on space cadets, space flight, and the occasional conspiracy theorist. Today, we're going to design an SSTO. This is the conclusion to my response to Everyday Astronauts' video, Why SSTOs Suck. Watch my response before you get into this to see why I'm doing this to myself. Since Everyday Astronaut didn't do trade studies, propulsion studies, or any real math, I have to. For this, we'll do trade studies for possible SSTO designs, look at a few configurations, and then discuss why they're impractical with alternatives. Ready? No. Okay, okay, so let's lay out what we're doing here today. This is going to be a very simple design study of single-staged orbit vehicles based on existing stages and design studies. The main focus will be with propulsion and structural ratios to give you an idea of what an SSTO would be like. I can't do much more than that in the time frames I give myself, nor do I have the adequate tools to do a proper detailed analysis that you'd see in you know, real studies. I don't have access to structural simulators, fluid simulators, trajectory sims, or any other tools I'd need for launch vehicle design. Nor am I going to touch on the economics of reuse. We all know where this will end. Okay, so the delta V to LEO is about 9.3 kilometers a second. Now, of course, in reality, this varies. It depends on your launch location, the launch azimuth, and a bunch of other factors. But this is the number we're going with. Now, for the reusable variants, which will be landing themselves, we're going to assume 200 meters a second of delta V for landing. We'll assume there's air brakes and other things to help it land. My SSTOs will also not be nuclear. That's right, Orion fanboys. No nukes! And there'll be no you know, magnetic trains, no uh, mountain launches, no air launch. Not a single luxury. The payload capacity for our SSTO is 20 tons to LEO. There's no particular reason for this, I just need my vehicle to be large. Smaller launch vehicles have greater delta V losses due to atmospheric drag and gravity, so a bigger one is naturally better. Propulsion and structures will be based on what's available from existing launch vehicles and studies. So let's take a look at that. Our ideal SSTO uses a propellant that has both high performance, so high specific impulse, and high bulk density. This combination means that your engines burn really well, really efficiently, and your vehicle ends up being really small, which maximizes your payload performance. All right, so this is the ideal case. Now, if you read the paper by David Whitehead that I'm citing, you'll discover that the actual performance of propellants is something like this. With the highest performing being LOX LH2 with really low bulk density. The paper, which is most of the basis of what I'm doing, uh, discusses the relationship between propellant and stage masses. I did a survey of launch vehicle first stages to look for a ratio between the dry structural mass and the propellant masses. As you can see by this graph, the trend is roughly linear. Oh, and I'm going to note here, these are pump-fed stages. Uh, pressure feds would be heavier. As White had noted, you can't really beat this trend. Even all composite stages bottom out at around 6% their propellant weights. You can only do worse. We'll be ignoring the differences between common bulkheads and separate tankage. Dr. Bruce Dunn did his own study of how bulk propellant density might impact SSTO performance. 
Now this design study isn't as detailed, but we'll look more into that as we get into the specific designs and propellant selections. My own analysis looked at specific propellant combinations and the structural masses of the stages that use them. I also looked at different SSTO studies to look for performance metrics to compare them to my own and assess them against existing launch vehicles. For our SSTOs, I'm looking at three possible configurations. Our first is an expendable system like Aquarius. Just able to get to LEO, no frills, just that. The other two will be reusable. The first will have no down mass capabilities. The second will be able to carry its payload back down to the surface. From the last video, we discovered the mass ratio R. R can be broken down into payload, propellant, and dry structural mass over the payload plus dry structural mass. Now, for what we're doing, we've discovered that you can relate your dry structural mass to the propellant involved. So the equation now becomes payload mass plus propellant, parentheses, one plus the structural ratio. Now, structural ratio depends on your propellant configurations. We'll get into that. The complicating factor for this design is that the vehicle will have a constant dry structural mass while the specific impulse of the engine varies over the flight, which will influence R. Okay, so for the expendable version of our rocket, the total propellant can be expressed this way. Now, for this, I'll only be using two specific impulse values. One will be an average over the, seal, the in atmospheric flight of the booster, and then the second one, R2, will be for vacuum optimized performance. So when the atmosphere is thin enough where it doesn't really matter. And you can see why I'm not using residual calculations in here, because this one would have gotten really nasty really fast. So total propellant is this, propellant for the second part of the burn here, and of course the first part is just the subtraction. For the reusable variant with no down mass, uh, the equation looks like this. Now, in this case, R1 refers to the mass ratio for the burn from the surface to orbit. No, no, no. We'll be using aerospike engines. That's next. And then R2 refers to the landing burn I discussed earlier. Which, so again, this is with no payload down mass. With down mass, it's the same equation as for an expendable version, just change R1 and R2 to meet these requirements. And so you can see here, it's actually really easy to get all of your things and you know, wish you were dead. Equations for calculating stage mass are based on the propellants used. For our engine design, the expendable SSTO will use an extendable nozzle. It's a simple system that's used on the RL-10B2 and some solid rockets. I'm doing this for sanity's sake. The vacuum optimized extension will have an area ratio of 150, while the non-extended version will be optimized for sea level. The reusable SSTOs will be using aero plug nozzles. Their performance figures will be based on data I can find and calculations based on bell nozzles. Bruce Dunn did his estimations with an optimized area ratio of 100 to 1 and the average ISP at 90% of vacuum. Cooler used an area ratio of 500 and average ISP of about 97%. I will use 200 and 93%. All engines will be running at 2000 PSI for the chamber pressure. Now, most engines you see run at like a thousand, but hey, we're building a paper rocket here. And 2000 isn't unheard of. The SSME ran at 3000 and the BE4 will run at 1950. I'm also assuming that the heating problems associated with aeroplug nozzles has been solved and isn't too heavy. So, you know, they're made of unobtainium or asbestos or something, which also means they can be used as heat shields. Like I said, this isn't exactly the strongest SSTO design study ever. Oh, and I'm designing nine SSTOs. Three configurations with three different propellants, just to prove a point. The classic SSTO design is a LOX LH2 system, since LOX LH2 has the highest performance of conventional chemical propellants. Nearly every SSTO design uses it, so we'll start there. 
Our first up is an expendable system with one issue that hydrogen brings that we're going to address right now. Liquid hydrogen has terrible density and pulse compared to other fuels. Watch the liftoff of a LOX LH2 first stage vehicle versus one that uses a different combination. Their trajectories are different. There are two ways to remedy this. The first is to use a tri-propellant system. Have an engine that burns kerosene first, then switches to hydrogen. Now, this is really complex, even though the Russians tried it once. The other is to change the mixture ratio of hydrogen and oxygen. Gary Hudson and a few others discovered that this was a lot simpler than building a tri-propellant engine. For this study, our boost phase engine will use a 12 to 1 mixture ratio of oxygen and hydrogen. This is based on the University Antares design study. Once the nozzle extends, then the mixture ratio changes back to a more conventional 6 to 1. Now onto the structures side of things. I did a survey of LOX LH2 first stages to get average values for them. And from that, I used four structural ratios for my calculations. Trend line is based off a trend line of data I used. Average is based on the average structural ratio I found. Ideals based on the SSTO design studies I could find. And then worst case scenario is based off the, you know, the heaviest one. As you can see, all four configurations are possible. Gross liftoff weights range between 233 and 477 metric tons. Even the worst case scenario is technically possible with current stage construction techniques. I'll be using the average value of the LOX LH2 expendable SSTOs rendered here. Uh, this one has 284 tons of propellant, weighs 31 tons dry, has a gross liftoff weight of 335 metric tons. But that's expendable. Expendable isn't innovative. Sure, you could do some smart style reuse with it. Plenty of studies do. But let's take a look at the reusable systems now. For this case, our structure ratios will be different. Heavier. This is because reuse requires more equipment on the vehicle, you know, heat shields, landing legs, and so on. Our structures are ideal, which is based off the beta series of SSTO, average, which is the same as above, conservative, which is 10% heavier than average, and then worst, which is based off the worst from above. We'll also drop the changing mixture ratio thing for this design and assume that the aeroplug configuration can compensate for thrust. I'm doing this for my own sanity. We're also going to make the same structural assumptions and performance estimates for the half reusable and fully reusable systems. Also for my own sanity. First up are the SSTOs with no down mass capabilities. Using Dunn's estimations, only the idealistic versions are possible. Using Cooler's assumptions, then all configurations are possible. My assumptions have only the ideal and average versions as possible. For our reusable SSTOs, there are a few configurations they can take. Now, these are all aesthetic because I'm not an aerodynamicist. So far, all of our reentry vehicles have been cones, bowls, headlights, and bricks. Now, all the SSTO designs I've seen are cones, so my SSTOs will look like mercury capsules. So this is the average version I looked at. 4,090 tons of propellant, weighs 446 tons dry, and weighs 4,555 metric tons at liftoff. Uh, using Cooler's assumptions, then it's about a fifth of that. The reusable versions with down mass are about the same. Uh, the average version of, based on my assessment is this. 4,310 tons of propellant, weighs 470 dry, with a gross liftoff weight of about 4,800 metric tons. To put this into perspective, the Saturn V weighed 2,900 tons at liftoff with about seven times the payload capacity. Nah, but hydrogen is a jerk. I mean, come on, it's really susceptible to heat leak. It's got really low density. The engines need to be specially built and so on. What if we didn't use hydrogen? If you look at the charts, you'll discover that on average, a hydrogen stages are 10.9% the weight of their propellants whereas you know, kerosene, hypergol, and peroxide stages are around 7.4%. That's a 32% difference there. 
This is because hydrogen has a really low bulk density of only 71 kilograms per cubic meter, whereas a fuel like kerosene is 810 kilograms per cubic meter. Dr. Bruce Dunn's paper on SSTOs focuses on the bulk densities of the propellants used with a set volume. So we will be doing that here with two densities, the baseline bulk density and then a densified propellant. Now, as we all should know at this point, changing the temperature of something can change its density. And guess what? This applies to propellants too. Uh, for example, SpaceX does this on the Falcon 9 to improve vehicle performance for reuse. For this, I took the average structural ratio of our dense propellant stages and then plotted them against the average bulk density of these propellants to get a trend line. And from that trend line, I could then calculate the uh, structural ratio of a dense stage based on the bulk density of the propellant. The propellants I examined were those that you could find in the Dunn paper and based on existing engines. Also, since I was using c Propep to calculate engine performance, I was limited to what was available there. Uh, ethylene was eliminated as a potential propellant because based on my own research, it would polymerize inside a regeneratively cooled engine. So that's some food for thought. I looked at three oxidizers for my SSTOs, LOX, dinitrogen tetroxide, and hydrogen peroxide. Now LOX and NTO should be obvious they've been flying forever. Hydrogen peroxide was included because it is 1.4 times as dense as liquid oxygen and has flown previously on the British Black Knight and Black Arrow launchers. It was also studied for the Beale BA-2 vehicle had it ever entered production. It's included because I saw one SSTO design study that used it, and also hydrogen peroxide is a room temperature storable propellant that doesn't give you cancer. So there's that. Engine calculations were the same sea level performance, and then a 150 to 1 nozzle extension. Structurally, there were five options for the system. Trend line, based on the trend line. Average, based on the average. Worst, based on the worst. Dense, based on the density calculations. And then densified, which is the density, but more dense. The results for the expendable version were astounding. All but two worked. Only the worst case LOX RP1 and peroxide RP1 stages didn't work. I'm not going to show you all the expendable configurations of this because this video is long enough. I was going to use these as a way of weeding out propellants for the fully reusable SSTOs, but since that didn't work, let's just get to them. I used similar assumptions as with the LOX LH2 stages as before. My calculations changed accordingly. So we have ideal, which is based off of low structural ratio. Average, based on the average. Conservative, 1.1 times average. And then dense, based off the bulk densified propellant. Only two of the no down mass uh, SSTOs worked. Those were the LOX UDMH and LOX methane stages based off of the idealistic structural weight and the cooler performance assumptions. None of the down mass SSTOs worked either. Now, I did do an analysis with a 3000 PSI LOX UDMH and LOX methane engine, but only those worked under the extremely idealistic cooler assumptions. So, our dense propellant SSTOs will be powered either by LOX methane or LOX UDMH. Now, lucky for us, LOX methane is under development in the United States right now, and the Russians did build a LOX UDMH engine once. Because of course they did. The expendable version I did was LOX UDMH with 491 tons of propellant, weighs 37 tons dry, and then has a gross liftoff weight of 548 metric tons. The somewhat reusable LOX methane SSTO has 7,035 metric tons of propellant, weighs 493 tons dry, and has a gross liftoff weight of 7,551 metric tons. That's a heavy one, all right. Expendable SSTOs will probably work, but a non-hydrogen, fully reusable system probably won't. Now, I know some of you will come at me with Rotary Rocket's alleged 5.9% structural ratio, but since that was a paper rocket, it wasn't actually built, so we don't know if they would have been able to achieve it or not. I'm going to say no. Man, SSTO seems impossible. 
But what if we didn't play by the rules? You see, if you look at the charts and rocket propulsion textbooks, you don't just see the ones that are commonly in use. You also see the weird ones. Oxidizers like chlorine trifluoride, or fuels like pentaborane. You know, names to run away from really fast. Oh, and I'm sorry to say, statistically speaking, now one of you has cancer. Some of these propellants have better performance than LOX hydrocarbons, or even LOX LH2, and with high density. I, I, I'm, I'm doing this part to prove a point. Uh, if, if I see any one of you popping up with an SSTO that's powered by something that can burn concrete, I only looked at two of these combinations, finally settling on uh, liquid fluorine and ammonia. Uh, the reason why is uh, the RD-301. The Soviets were planning to use that engine as a high-energy fourth stage for the proton rocket until they realized that fluorine was horrible. I obviously used the same methods as above, only this time making reasonable assumptions on stage dry weights, because no one's actually built and flown a fluorine stage before. As per usual, the expendable version works no matter what. Uh, this version has 245 tons of propellant, weighs 20 tons dry, and has a gross liftoff weight of about 285 metric tons. The no down mass version only works with Cooler's idealistic assumptions with 2,600 metric tons of propellant, 215 tons dry, and a gross liftoff weight of uh, 2,855 metric tons. The fully reusable one using fully idealistic assumptions uh, has 2,380 tons of propellant, weighs 195 dry, with a gross liftoff weight uh, 2,600 metric tons ish. It's about the size of a Saturn V. Ta da! I made SSTO's Not in Kerbal Space Program. See, Everyday Astronaut, I did it! So as you can see, SSTO is possible. Possible does not mean practical. Just imagine the issues your SSTO program would face. It's likely that the first production units would be heavier than the mass margins, rendering them just high-velocity test articles. And there's plenty of other issues in development there. And this is not to mention the operational issues that a reusable variant would have. Our reusable SSTOs would be finicky machines, incredibly sensitive to launch conditions, pad infrastructure, and oh god, the repairs. You can already imagine how sensitive these things would be to damage. Now let's take a look at, you know, what about thermal stresses? What about fatigue lives? What is the surface life of our components? But there are alternatives. The easiest alternative to an SSTO is a stage and a half booster. Why? It's been done before. The Atlas launch vehicle, up until Atlas 3, used a stage and a half configuration. There would be three engines that lit at liftoff. Now, in flight, the two outboard engines, the boosters, which were optimized for atmospheric flight, would be dropped off. Only the booster engines and their structure. The tankage and the center engine, also called the sustainer, would push the vehicle into orbit. 1.5 stage was also studied for a Saturn V successor called the uh, Saturn V-B. NLS-1 used six STMEs and dropped four in flight. This does allow for smart style reuse of your booster stage, if you're inclined for that sort of thing. However, the one caveat is this is another ballistic vehicle. This will be dropping somewhere downrange. And there is one alternative. The other alternative for this kind of vehicle uses a pop-up trajectory and is called an assisted SSTO. Uh, for this, your first stage goes straight up, putting your second stage, most likely LOX LH2, on a suborbital trajectory. Then, your second stage will separate, turns, and burns to orbit. Your first stage will come down pretty much straight on top of the old launch site, and your second stage could also be reusable. For Delta V performance, your second stage needs about 7.4 kilometers a second, which is a lot more than you'd normally see, but this is doable. This design was discussed heavily in the rocket company, was the original vision for the Kistler rocket family, and I think was a DARPA Falcon proposal. The pop-up trajectory has 
the benefits of both two-stage and single-stage vehicles, in that it can be launched from kind of anywhere and can be fully reused without the hassles of engine and weight performance constraints. Yeah, but does it have wings? Do SSTOs suck? They're either not practical or not possible. I just proved it with 264 possible designs. Unless there is a breakthrough with propulsion or structures, this is not a smart design. And especially with toxic propellants. Build a two or three stage vehicle like a normal person would. I'm the pressure fed astronaut, one chart deep. Now, since a lot of you will have questions and concerns, I have written a lot that might be answered in the description. So please, dear God, look at that before commenting. Oof, that was a rough and long one to get to. Uh, last time I asked you what this was. It appears I fooled some of you with the inclusion of some Saturn hardware. This is actually Gary Hudson's Liberty II, the design that was a precursor to Liberty X. The plan was to use spare F1s and J2s to build a first stage reusable shuttle class booster. By the way, you can tell it was meant to be reused by the shape of the tanks. Now, in competition for the Saturn hardware was Boeing for their own MLV, uh, later known as Jarvis. Now, it was discovered about right after these engines were uncovered that you can't actually build Saturn hardware again, so Jarvis and this version of Liberty II were shelved. Now, there are three versions that evolved, not these three, and as of course, as we all know, they, they flew so many times. We're still using them today. So now, what is this? And do any of you have the trade studies for this design? Uh, that's all. Uh, bye.